brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello, everyone out there, and welcome to another episode of the Badminton Podcast. Whether you're a first-time listener or you listen to us consistently, we just want to say thanks so much for your support, and we're really happy to bring you another episode. Just for those who haven't met myself, I'm Jeff, and my co-host over there is Henry. (laughs) You meant to say hi, Henry. Hello. (laughs) I was was letting you do the talk. (laughs) We're really proud to bring you this podcast because we're coming from a place of love and a love for badminton. Look, we really love the sport and that's why we started our brand, Volant Wear, and the Badminton Podcast so that we could, one, give players a bit of an alternative to those unsightly, colourful, conventional badminton clothing so you can wear clothes that make you feel good, stylish, and confident anywhere that you go. And also, the podcast, which is bringing the badminton community together so that we can share the love of the sport with everyone, whether they play badminton or not, because it is such a truly amazing sport to be playing. So make sure you check us out and shop at www.volantwear.com. There are also lots of free resources there that can help you with your game, as well as some reviews. And you can always contact us if you have any questions. You can also follow us on our social media. Our handle is at Volantwear, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. And also just recently, we have set up a Patreon account and the Patreon account is just so that the people out there like yourselves who love listening to us and love talking about badminton can support the badminton podcast in bringing regular episodes because we love to and your support is very, very much appreciated. So today we have another international badminton player on our podcast and we are really proud to introduce her and Henry is going to do the honors. Thank you, Jeff. So today's guest is a 27-year-old Mexican badminton player who has been playing the sports since she was 10. She started representing Mexico's team as a junior athlete in Pan American events since 2005. So far in her career, she has played in many international events, such as the first Youth Olympic Games in Singapore in 2010, World Junior Championships, Pan American Games, and Central American Games as well. She's a seven-time medalist at the Central American Games, bronze medalist in the Pan American Championships in 2017, and she's also collected a number of medals in the Pan American circuit through the years. She loves the sport greatly and what it has given to her in all these years and hoping to share her best experiences with us through this podcast. I will have to say, follow your dreams. It had helped me a lot. When I got in love with badminton, I just thought that I could be a good player and play maybe Olympics. I never quit on that goal. So I would have to say to everyone to follow their dreams and also to never quit. There are always possibilities and opportunities that maybe you don't see clearly. But if you look and you ask and you start making good contacts and relationships, you will always find people that will help you. Never be afraid to ask ask for help because I'm sure that there will be people willing to help. She is Mariana Ugaude. I, I don't know how to, spell, how to actually say your last name. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. Yeah, Ugaude is fine. Yeah. How, would, how would you say yourself as a native speaker? Mariana Ugalde. Okay, let me try again. Mariana Ugalde. Ah, uh, that's better. That's very good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm very happy for being here and thank you for inviting me. I think it's very important to support badminton and as we are badminton lovers and it's also a great opportunity to share my experiences and how badminton has changed my life. So I'm very happy to be with you guys and well, let's get started with the questions. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. So before we start into the badminton questions and then talking about your badminton career, let the audience help to understand you and get to know you a little bit more. So we're going to ask you just a few little questions to get started that are just quick fire and you can just answer whatever the first thing comes to your head. Sure. Let's do it. So first of all, where were you born and where did you grow up? 
I was born in Mexico City and I grew up here all my life. I've been living here in Mexico. Also, I've been traveling a lot, but my residence is Mexico all the time. Cool. Okay. Next question. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I think uh, maybe seven. Seven? Seven. Yeah, okay. I would say seven. Yeah. Seven consistently <laughs> or you, you fluctuate between seven and another number? Maybe six to nine. Six to nine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a solid amount. <laughs> <laughs> well, our scale is about 10 to 15 out of 10, I think, yeah. Henry. So oh my she's God. doing better than us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many languages do you speak? And if you were going to choose an extra language you could speak, what would it be? Okay, so I speak Spanish, English, and a little bit of Portuguese. And if I had the opportunity to know another one, I think it would be French. I like French. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Je m'appelle Henry. Je m'appelle Mariana. <laughs> that, yes. That's all I can say as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, does pineapple belong on a pizza? Oh, big oh, one. no, no way. No, I'm against that. <laughs> yeah. okay. You're going to lose some fans here, Marion. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, I don't like it. How do you take your coffee? Uh, I like it with uh, milk and sugar. Yeah, most of the times. Well, in Melbourne, we're big coffee snobs over here. Really? I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't add sugar to my, to my coffee, but. What about oh. you, Jeff? No, nah, no sugar for me. I'm a dentist, yeah. so no, no sugar. It's bad for your teeth, you know? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Drink it with a straw. I'll try to lower it down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So comedy versus horror. Comedy movies. Yeah, all the time. But I also like horror movies. It's no problem. As long as I'm not alone while I'm watching, they're fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just a couple more. So one more from me. If you were having a really bad day and there was something in your fridge that would make you feel better, what would it be? I would have to say maybe ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. Flavor? Yeah. Chocolate ice cream. Chocolate ice cream. Yeah. Chocolate. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> Good choice. So in a, is, is it called the Napoleon? Is it? Neapolitan. Neapolitan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Neapolitan. Neapolitan. Yeah. You would go for the chocolate. Yeah. Vanilla uh, or chocolate. But I think when I'm sad... I would prefer chocolate. Chocolate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good enough. comfort food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good choice. And what are you not very good at, Mariana? I'm not very good at swimming. Yeah. I don't like swimming. <laughs> I don't like water that much. So I, I prefer not to do it. Okay. So do, do you mean swimming as in if you need to swim laps or you need to swim in the ocean? Or what if it's more just like relaxing in the pool or by the beach? Do you enjoy that? Or you just don't like water at all? I, I don't like swimming and doing the lap thing. I, yeah. I don't even know how to do it right. <laughs> but uh, if it's for relaxing, I can do it for a while. It's not my favorite thing to do, but, but it would be fine. Sure. Yeah. I'm just not that into water i guess yeah. <laughs> but, more of a land yeah. creature yeah yeah sure <laughs> do you do much recovery in the water in the swimming pools though yeah like recovery for training and hydrotherapy stuff yeah actually once a week i do it uh mm -hmm. when i was training like really hard i had to do it and do the eye stop thing and also for recovering for a knee surgery okay yep. yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had to do a lot of things mm. in the pool. So, yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with water, but I don't like it that much. Mm. So you've had knee surgery, have you? Yeah, yeah, I do. Mm. What happened? Uh, I was playing badminton uh, in a tournament. It was not an official one, but at the last point, actually, of the match, I tore the ligaments. Oh. So I I needed the surgery. The last point. Did you win, though? That's the most important thing. Did you win? <laughs> I was winning and I you couldn't. Were winning. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it oh, was the last point. Devastating. Yeah. So mm. it, it was a pretty hard time for me. I needed mm. a lot of time to recover. I was out for almost six months and then I had mm. to start uh, from zero. It was it was a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can't, can't even imagine that 
I've seen people do their their was it the ACL like the the main ligament the most common yeah. ligament yeah I've seen people do that and I've also seen people tear their Achilles I've seen them fall down and oh, it's so bad it oh it, it's, <laughs> it's horrible scary. it's so yeah, horrible yeah. and I can't imagine and I don't want to dig into it but usually what people say is that they they feel something but then it doesn't hurt and then they fall to the ground and they think what what happened and then all of a sudden it's just pain is that what you experienced yeah for me the first moment when when it tore it was really painful then i didn't feel anything but i think the most painful part was the recovery Mm. because then your leg stays still for a very long time so when you have to do all the movements again it's really painful yeah yeah i i was crying a lot yeah yeah Yeah. i think Mm. It's one of the worst things that has ever happened to me. Yeah, I think two of the worst injuries in badminton. The knee, that one, and then the Achilles. Yeah, Yeah, also the Achilles. Horrible, horrible injuries. Anyway, let's let's move away from that. I'm sure we'll touch on it a little bit as we keep (laughs) as we keep moving forward into your badminton story. So for someone like yourself growing up in Mexico, living in Mexico and playing badminton in Mexico. From our understanding, it's not a really big sport in the country. So how did you actually get involved and where did you start from? Uh, it started when I was 10. My parents used to play it on the weekends for like hobby. They taught me how to hit the shuttle and it was a very like non-professional way to start. But then I really liked it and there were some classes going on there in the club. So I started was just training like once a week and I started liking it too much and more and more and more. And then I just got into the professional style. Yeah. Yep. So you started playing when you were, you were pretty young then. And then when did you start training and, and thinking, oh, I want to be really good at this sport, not just play it for fun? Well, it started when I started to play some tournaments. I mean, it was just like inter-clubs tournaments. And then I got into the state to the state team. State team, yep. Yeah, and then I started nationals. So it wasn't like I was doing it professionally, but when I started to play in the nationals, it really hit me and I said, okay, maybe I'm kind of good at this and I really liked it and it was no problem for me to train. So I decided to look forward and start looking for some other options of training because where I was training, it was only available for two days a week. So I started looking for other options and other places to, to practice. And that's where I started to take it more seriously and started to worrying about getting results. Also, I was, I think, 13 when I got out of the country. I started playing in Cuba for a Central American tournament. And then I felt like the passion for badminton and it just went through the years and yeah. here I am. Seems like a natural progression for you. And you went to Cuba to play in the Central American Games when you were 13. So when did you join the national team then? Uh, I was in the junior national team when I was 13. Mm-hmm. And then I got into the national team when I was 16. And yeah, it started like that. But I was in the national team when I was just 13 and playing junior tournaments. Uh, We have in America the Pan Am Junior Championships. Mm -hmm. So I first played them when I was 14. And I I did it till I was 18 years old. And when I was 16, I was on both teams, like in the junior team and also in the national team. Yeah, wow. And even as part of being in the national team, you only could train twice a week. Is that right? No, no, no. Then uh, when I was 15, I got more serious and I was training every day from Monday to Friday, I think. And also when I got into the national team, we got uh, like a camp to go to Central American Games. Yeah. So I was training like more seriously and I could experience like the professional way to do it. And then I just kept doing it. 
Okay, good. That's amazing. Now, with badminton in Mexico, from our understanding, because we have spoken to Lino in the past, it's not the biggest sport, but it is it is getting more popular and that's attributed by yourself and players like yourself and Lino. So when you were actually trying to develop in the sport, how did you find it? Was the progression of the development fast or slow? Was it something that was easy for you? Was it something that was quite difficult? What was it like trying to develop your badminton skills in a country that perhaps didn't have a lot of infrastructure or support for people like yourself trying to be professional badminton players? Yeah, so here in Mexico, we don't have a very big budget to sports that are not that popular. So if you're here and I say to anyone that I play badminton, they for sure wouldn't know what it means. Yeah, still. So, yeah, still. But it's been a, a long way. I think we have been trying to develop it ourselves. I mean, we, we just focus on some goals and like to think out of the box. We started training and I think Lino called a coach from Malaysia and he actually went to Mexico so we could do the development ourselves. We just pushed ourselves, the ones that were in the national team, and we agreed to do our best and to try to develop, even if it was very difficult with the budget that the government gave us. Mm. So through the years, we always wanted to look for the best things that we could have. There are maybe two or three coaches from Asia that wanted to help us and who actually traveled to Mexico knowing that it would be very hard and they all had problems with the federation. Well, things were not good, things were not clear and they didn't have a good payment. So it has always been trouble for us to get a national coach. And also we had to look forward and try to play in another countries. So I think, for example, you know, went to train in Malaysia. Mm. We went to Hungary where we met this guy. Uh, I, I think you know him, Alan. Mm. He's the national coach from Hungary. I'm not sure. He's, uh, he's from Scotland. Well, anyway, if you don't know him, it's fine. I probably know his face. but Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you know him. But he was very kind with us and he saw that we were trying to develop ourselves. So he invited us to Hungary and we were there for one year. Oh, and wow. Wow. I think that we, we just knew how to move ourselves through the tournaments and to make contacts so we could share and learn from other countries and... They were very kind. We had a lot of friends that helped us to travel, to improve. And also, I don't know, there were times that we had to train ourselves and do the training programs alone. So mm. we were just like very motivated to improve, to put Mexico in another place and to do things that were not done before. So yeah, I think we are a good team. We were young at that time. We all had the same goals. So we supported each other and tried to look for better opportunities. Yeah. And I want to come back to where Mexico is now in terms of badminton and badminton participation. But I want to touch on how you were able to support yourself and how you are currently supporting yourself, especially because like you said, you know, there's not a lot of funding for a country like Mexico. How are you supporting yourself financially while you're playing professionally? Well, uh, when we were younger, we didn't know a lot. So we just agreed for what the government gave us. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, you will have three tournaments in the year. Sometimes we went to the three tournaments, sometimes only two. It depended on how they, they handle things. But after we, we could know a little bit more of how tournaments were held, then we tried to look for supporters, for sponsors. And as I told you before, we made a very good contact and relationships with important people. So for example, now we have the support of our club. They give a little bit of funding for us. They pay some tournaments to the ones that are training there. And also when I was younger, well, I had to use my own money, of course. My family supported me a lot and they helped me to get where I was, where I am right now, actually. But yeah, it's, it's been really hard. We have a lot of canceled tournaments. We had to withdraw for a lot of tournaments through the year. And... 
also, as I told you, this guy from Hungary helped us a lot. So we got funding from the club in Hungary. So it was very weird because in Mexico, we had no support. But in Hungary, they supported us a lot. Wow. Yeah, so we were traveling and playing tournaments, representing Mexico, but actually by, by Hungary. So it was crazy. And also, I think that with the results that we were getting, the government put more attention to us. So they extended the funding. And that's a very good achievement that we could gain. So through the years, with the results that we had, we made them take notice and give us more support. Yeah. Now, that's such great support from a country that you weren't even playing for, but they saw that you had the potential and wanted to support you. So I'm sure that you're extremely appreciative of those opportunities that you had because of your time in Hungary. And Mariana, I know that you said that you've trained in other countries as well. So not just Hungary, where have you trained throughout your career? And what have the differences been? What type of training and training style do you tend to like more? Okay, so when I was 15, I got with a Chinese coach here in Mexico. He was training here and it was pretty hard. It was very exhausting, all the sessions. And we got the opportunity to go to China for a camp. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty much the same training. It was very weird because the exercise that they put us were almost the same as what we were doing in Mexico. But it was a very nice experience because there were some other Pan Am players there and people from all the world. So it was a very good training camp. Also, I had the opportunity to go to India for a state league. It was very interesting. We didn't have any idea of how that would work, but it was pretty cool. We we got to train with AJ yep. and also with Tom John for two weeks. Oh, really? I trained with Tom John. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I liked it a lot. And, and I think we learned a lot. Also, I went to train to Portugal for one month. I was there with other three Mexican guys. So yeah, it's also hungry and well, mostly I've trained in Mexico. As I told you, we, we brought two or three Asian coaches there. And when we didn't have them, then we do our plans ourselves with the experience that Lino had in Malaysia. There mm-hmm. was another guy that went to Indonesia for, I think, one year. So we, we had to pay a lot of attention. We had to write everything uh, down. And when we were in Mexico alone, then then we do it ourselves. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really good that you, you're so motivated to be able to push yourself and go beyond what you're sort of confined to in Mexico. And I want to come back to where badminton participation and, and what the situation is for badminton in Mexico these days are. Compared to when you first started, has many things changed? Uh, It has changed and it has improved and sometimes it gets worse. Right now, I think uh, we have more development in Mexico. It has helped a lot that the team that I just talked about has do a great job. So we have incented some other young players to keep playing and to look forward and to push themselves and prove them that it's possible to be a, a good player. So... I think it's better, but there's still a lot of work to do. I think the Federation has to look for the players and support them more and to build maybe a national team that has a national coach and to plan for uh, some tournaments because I think that Mexico has very good players, but they have to do everything on their own. Mm. So I think, yes, there are improvements, but they have been not enough yet and still a lot of work to do because now that we are not that into badminton, I mean, the ones that started this national team, we were maybe eight to 10 players and now we have grown up and, and it's hard uh, for us to be in contact or in touch with all the young players. So I think that's what the Federation should do. They should learn from what we did in the past so they can do something like that and to 
think out of the box and try to make an improvement because nowadays I think they just want it to stay the same. I mean, if the young players don't go out and they don't understand how badminton works exactly, then they will keep doing the same things and and it just doesn't make any improvement. At the same result. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And with the time that you've spent playing badminton, so I think it's what well, is it almost 20 years that you've been playing for? Yeah, almost. Yep. Like 15, 15, 20 yeah. years. Yep. So w- what has kept you really driven to keep playing the sport? So what do you love about the sport? Do you love the competitive side? Do you love the training side? Do you love the commitment? Do you love trying to achieve goals? Do you love the sport like actually playing? Is it really still really fun to play? What has drawn you to badminton for so long over the period of your life so far? Well, I think when I started, I I fell in love on how fun it is. I really enjoyed playing just for fun. And that made me want to do more. Now, I think... Sorry, someone is knocking the door. So I got a little distracted. <laughs> it's okay. They can join the podcast if they want to. Yeah. No, I don't know who that Special is. Special guest. I don't know who that is. But... Special guest, we don't know who. Yeah, cameo appearance. Is Lino going to be? Yes, Lino. I was really inspired. And then I, I heard the knocking and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, no, but my, my family is over. I was taking, taking care oh, of it. Okay, taking care of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think I, I love that part. I love the sport. And also, I'm a very decent girl. So I love the trainings. I know they sometimes are very hard, but I really love to feel tired and to do the footwork things and everything. I really like it. I like to feel tired all day and I don't know. Also, the tournaments are very fun. You get to meet a lot of friends from other countries. Mm. You get to travel a lot because of the system that the BWF has. You have to play tournaments all around the world. So I think that's what really got me in love with badminton. Great. And I know that you said you love the hard training and you love working hard and doing all the footwork. So the next question is... We spoke to Lino and we know that you were really successful on a Mexican TV show yeah. to, to us yeah. because we don't know it. It's kind <laughs> of like Ninja Warrior where there's obstacle courses and everything like that, right? And it's called... Ex- Exactron, how do you say right? Exaton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm terrible at the pronunciation, but um, <laughs> no, it was okay actually. <laughs> <laughs> but w- what would you say is harder? Is it harder to train for badminton or to do the obstacle courses on that show? Oh, I know. Definitely playing badminton is more, it's harder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, I think people don't realize how much you have to train to be a good player. I mean, it takes maybe six hours a day, do a lot of things, physical training, technique. You have to develop a lot of skills. And I think people don't notice how hard it is. And it also helped me with a lot of things in the program. I went there and there were people from a lot of sports and we all had different skills. Mm. I think it helped me a lot with some of them. You had to do a lot of things to throw some objects and yeah 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 so, so that would have been quite easy for you right compared to yeah it was easier for me uh, mm. than it was for other people from different sports who had never tried anything like that before mm. because i told them that we do a lot of technique and we have to get the shuttle right in the line or to yeah yep. you know to the to, corner yeah yeah yep. yeah yeah it's more, more accuracy training yeah 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 so it helped me a lot and I also think that playing badminton is really hard. It's not as easy as it seems. And it, it requires a lot of physical training that maybe you can't appreciate it when you don't know how the professional sport is. Yeah, especially if you haven't been exposed to the sport like we have. There are so many aspects of becoming a good or great badminton player that, that is not just physical but mental as well. And you were talking about sort of throwing objects. I remember... Unfortunately, I tried to find videos of you on the show and I stumbled upon your elimination video. <laughs> oh my God, that is so sad. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you, when, you, when you were against 
is it Michelle Tanori? And you're, you're talking about, yeah, your accuracy. Yeah, you were very good at throwing the sandbags right at the end of that course. So I definitely agree there. The uh, badminton skills helped you with that one. But I was very sad to, to see you get eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it, <laughs> it was pretty exciting. I think there was a lot of drama because you are there and you're isolated from everything. You don't have access to technology or anything. You can't communicate. You are just allowed to talk to the guys from your team. And it's an everyday game that you have to play and you can either win or lose and go and sleep on the floor. <laughs> or if you win, you get the nice house. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of a mental game. And there was a lot of drama in my elimination. I'm Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you watched that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I could sense the sadness um, when when you were lying there on yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I can cry right now oh, if, no. if you remind me that. <laughs> so, just for the listeners who don't know what the show's about, could you just give them a little bit of a recap as to what you do in the show, and then after that, I was just wondering. If you find throwing the sandbags quite easy because of badminton, was there something that you found really hard but then other athletes were doing quite easily, like the other way around? Um, I will start with the description of the show. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah there, there were two teams. Uh, it was the red ones and the blue ones. I was part of the red ones. So every day you had to play for a different price. During the week, you played to gain the good house or the awful awful place to stay oh, okay. uh, the bad house <laughs> yeah so it was pretty hard because it was a lot of stress we we didn't want to go and sleep on the floor uh, you also played for rewards such as going to the movies or to listen to music for one hour or to be able to dance with other people or maybe a very good meal at a good restaurant. So it was very dramatic because those rewards were the only thing that could distract you during the day. If you lose these games, then you will have to go and sleep on the floor <laughs> and don't have a good food or maybe you would just be bored the next three days. So it was very, very fun. Uh, you got to meet a lot of good friends because without cell phones, without technology, without TV, without talking to your family, you get to know a lot better the people that are around you. So it, it was a very nice experience. I think you learn a lot you learn more than you think. So it wasn't actually about the game because it was fun to do the circuits and sometimes swim, sometimes had to throw objects, sometimes had to run, sometimes had to jump. But I think it was more like a mental game. So it was fun. We all had our own skills, as I told you before. I wasn't very fast at the circuits, but I was good at throwing things. Yeah. And there were a lot of different endings to the points. Sometimes it was sandbags. Sometimes we had to throw some rings. Sometimes there were like this, the things that are used in track and, and field for the... The baton. The baton. The, yeah. The, what, yeah. the relay mm -hmm. that you pass. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. Sometimes we had to throw them and sometimes we had to break things. There were a lot of endings. I enjoyed all of them I was good at rather than being fast <laughs> on the circuit. <circuits>. Yep. <laughs> I don't know why, but I wasn't very fast. So yeah, uh, you get used to throw things. You get like very used to keep changing the objects. You learn to focus and to gain the points for your team. And then you could get some rewards. So. Yeah, it was quite a, a, an experience. I think it is very hard to be there. There are some people that can't can do it. They just start crying and they want to go out and finish the, their participation in the show. Oh. So yeah, I'm, I'm really proud that I could be there for six months. It's also very good because you get the attention from people that don't know anything about badminton. Mm -hmm. So now they can relate and say, Hey, I, I know Mariana, I know she plays badminton. So I want to know a little bit more about that. What is, yeah. And and that's one of the objectives of why I, I accepted to go there. Yeah. Yeah. And being on there for six months would have been 
painful. I think <laughs> yeah, this is what, like every day it's like, am I going to sleep in the good house or am I going to sleep on the floor today? <laughs> yeah, it's like that. And you have to stay uh, under the sun for a, a very long time. My skin was Sunburnt. a lot clearer. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, so with the being on the show and being able to expose badminton more to the public, so they, at least they have a question they ask themselves and they think, oh, well, Mariana plays badminton. What is that? From the show itself, just based on your Instagram, I know there you've got quite a few followers. I think there's 110,000 followers. Has that helped at all in terms of your exposure as a badminton player? So now that you're finished with the show, do you get more opportunities? Do people contact you about maybe representing their brands or to... Is there anything that's come out of the show that has helped you to progress your badminton career? Yeah, sure. I think all athletes that are on the show and they agreed to participate. They are looking for this that you just said. Mm. We want more sponsors. We want more funding. And yeah, they, they focus a lot on the number of followers you have. So we know that once we go on TV, you get the attention and you can really talk to some brands and to represent them. So yeah, I, I have not a lot, but there are offers from different brands. I have messages from a lot of young players, well, young want-to-be players. They ask me where they can go to training, where they can learn, where they can watch some games. And I have been trying to show them how badminton is. I've uploaded some videos of some tournaments that I've played and they are always asking. And that's one of the main points on going on TV. And if I want to keep playing, then I hope I can find more funding and more support and not depend on the government funding. Mm. So yeah, I think that's one of the targets and it has worked good. I gain a lot of followers now and they are interested and I get some calls. So yeah, I think it has helped a lot. And I also think that if Lino and I keep showing what we do, now it's been a little hard because when I arrived to Mexico, we we had to stay home. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't start training yet. I look forward to it. I, I want to start training and show all my followers how badminton is done. Yeah. So are you saying that immediately after Exatlon, you actually went back to Mexico and have been in lockdown since? Is that right? Yeah, I came to Mexico in February when I got eliminated, but then I was invited to the final. So I had to go there for two more weeks. I was just in Mexico for, I think, three weeks in February. I went back to Dominican Republic. And when we came back, we had to To stay home. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So the 110,000 followers that you have are missing out on all the badminton that you could be showing them right now. Yeah, yeah, it's been hard. (laughs) It's been almost one year since I stopped because I went to the show in August. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's been crazy. I've never stopped for so long. Not even with my knee surgery. That was six months and now it's almost one year. Wow. So yeah, I hope I can train good again and, and improve my levels too. Yeah. Oh, you must yeah. be dying to get back on the court then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I miss it a lot because yeah. as I told you, I've been doing this since I was 10 years old. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm used to be uh, training and to do everything around badminton. So yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been really hard. Yeah. I'm sure it'd be terrible right now for for every professional badminton player who really just is dying to be on court. Uh, Also, we didn't know what was happening because we had no communication. So when we came here and heard everything about coronavirus, we were like, what is this? Oh, you didn't know. Oh, you didn't. Okay. So you didn't know at all. Like a zombie apocalypse. Yeah. (laughs) We didn't actually have the information. So yeah, it was everything was new for us. And yeah, it's a, a really weird time yeah. for everybody, I think. Certainly a very weird time. So in the short term, Mariana, would I be correct in saying that going to the Olympics would be your goal? Well, uh, I tried to start the Olympic year last May and I was hoping to qualify to Tokyo. But then this opportunity to be on the show came up mm. and I took it because I wanted to promote and to to build a better future for me and try to gain the attention and get more funding. I didn't know that I was going to stay for so long. I thought mm. that if I was there for maybe one, two or 
maybe three months. Then when I got back to Mexico, I could keep trying to Tokyo, but... Six months, yeah. Things wow. <laughs> got yeah, wow. out of control. Yeah. I was there for six months. So when I came back, uh, it was very hard for me to think about Tokyo just because of how much you lose without training. And also there's not enough time. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, I don't know now. I would be very happy to try to go to Paris yeah. maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I want to keep training and to keep playing tournaments here in America first and trying to get my level to where I was. So yeah, I will try. I will try Paris, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And you can learn French at the see. same time. Yeah, yeah, you can learn French. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know. Sometimes I think I, I'm getting too old for this. I don't know. No, not yet. <laughs> but yeah, definitely I'll, I'll keep training. I'm looking forward to to return to the courts. Great. So, yep. yeah, we'll see. And if, for example, after Paris, when you do hopefully make the, the Paris Olympic Games there, what's after that for Mariana? Do you have anything that you want to do specifically outside badminton? Or even if it's after you've finished playing professionally, do you want to stay in badminton? What does your life look like after that? Well, uh, right now I'm starting an MBA. I will try to finish it. Yep. And also I would love to teach badminton, to be a badminton coach. I am a coach for young players, for little kids. I give classes to kids from four years to 10 years old. So I really enjoy doing that. I, I really like to teach what I've learned. I will keep doing that. I want to keep teaching badminton and also maybe be part of the federation and try to make badminton better here in Mexico. That's one of my main goals. I want to keep supporting my sport and keep helping on the development of it. So yeah, that's what I plan to do. Maybe I can do it while I'm being a player. I mean, it doesn't have to be after I quit. So yeah, I, I will try to keep helping, keep developing my sport and try to, to show people how good and how fun badminton is. So yeah, that's that's my plan. I want to keep yeah. teaching little kids. I love little kids. So <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's one thing I really enjoy. And badminton is a very nice way to... to can- yeah, to do yeah. that, to yeah. connect with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> really, I really love that vision, Mariana. And of course, as part of the Badminton Podcast, we have a very similar vision to that. So we are very excited for you and I hope that you will be able to teach all these little kids about the beauty of the sport of badminton. And what I want to do now is ask you if if someone in the audience was was listening to this and I'm sure they've gained a lot of information, they've gained a lot of knowledge and been able to, I guess, appreciate your passion for the sport so far on this podcast, which we do thank you for. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. And in terms of if you were to give them three pieces of advice that you've gained from your experiences that could help them become... A, a better badminton player or B, just a better person? What would you say? Well, I will have to say follow your dreams. It had helped me a lot. When I got in love with badminton, I just thought that I could be a good player and play uh, maybe Olympics. So I never quit on that goal. So I would have to say to everyone to follow their dreams and also to never quit. I mean, there there are always possibilities and opportunities that maybe you don't see clearly at the moment. But if you look and you ask and you start making good contacts and relationships, you will always find people that will help you. And that would be a very good advice from myself because I've lived it and Mm. it has helped me a lot. So yeah, I would have to say never quit and always look forward and look for opportunities and never be afraid to ask, ask for help because I'm sure that there will be people willing to help. Yeah, that's an awesome point. And you just stole the words out of my mouth because I was going to summarize and say, ask for help. And you just said it. And it comes back to a quote that I think I told Henry maybe a week or two ago. And it's basically, I think so. Yeah. you get whatever you have the courage to ask for. 
So don't ever be afraid to ask because the worst they can do is say no, right? And you're still in the same position that you're in before you asked other than you've, yeah, you've got an opportunity that they'll say yes. And you'll be amazed at how much people do want to help when you just ask them. So that's amazing and great take home information for everyone out there. So Mariana, for someone listening who doesn't already follow you, who isn't one of the 110,000 people who follow you and keep up with what you're doing, how can they get to know you and follow you from that perspective? Like how can they see how you're going, what you're doing, et cetera? Okay, so I am active in all social media, I think. <laughs> sure. uh, yeah, they can follow me on my Facebook page, which is Mariana Ugalde. And if you type badminton, then you'll find me. Mm-hmm. I, I try to upload their badminton material, everything that has to be with trainings and tournaments and maybe some achievements that I've had with sport. Also, there's my Instagram account that is Mariana underscore... Ugalde, see, yeah. mm-hmm. there they can know more about me, my daily life. It doesn't have to be mainly sports. I upload things that have to do with my career, with the MBA I'm taking, mm. also trainings and tournaments. I upload everything. And I have a Twitter account, which is the same one as Instagram, Mariana underscore Ugalde, C. Yeah, I think that are my main social media. I'm also doing TikToks right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, <okay. laughs> yeah. Have you done the savage dance yet? Oh, uh, no, no, no. I do more like uh, soap opera phrases. Okay. I like to, to act and, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. And do dialogues and stuff. Yeah. Okay. That's what I like more. So they can follow me on TikTok also. <laughs> and that's the, that's the same handle? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. The same, same yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. So we'll put that in the uh, podcast description for all those listeners out there if they want to Great. get in contact with Mariana. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. So Mariana, we just want to say thank you so much for being on this episode of the Babins podcast. I hope you had as much fun as we did. And it was really interesting just to explore, yeah, not just badminton in Mexico, but also you as a person. And then also reflect on being on the game show, being, I'm not going to say it because I can't remember the name and I'm not good at saying it. Is that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that one. Um, and I, it just got me thinking that we should have a game show like that for us in yeah, Australia yeah. <laughs> or, so, or, so, or something where they, we can expose athletes because it is just really about that exposure. And I do think that once people understand the sport a little bit more, then they'll mm. appreciate it more. If they appreciate it more, then they'll think it's a good sport, which it really is. And then all of a sudden, I think that will just get the wheels turning and get people a lot more interested in it. So it's really great. You've used that platform and taken that opportunity to one, build your own personal brand because that's important to build your personal brand, but at the same time doing that and you're helping badminton too and yourself and Lino are doing a great job. So thanks for doing that for badminton, whether you're in Mexico or anywhere in the world. And once again, thanks so much for being on this podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I had a lot of fun and I hope you learn a little bit about the show. Definitely. And also <laughs> I, it was very nice to meet you. You, you seem to have a very nice goal of letting people know that badminton exists and it's a very good work to try to contact people from all the countries from different continents it's a very nice project i really appreciate uh, you inviting me and for sure i will share it to all of my followers and if they are interested i hope this badminton family can grow a lot more fantastic thank you so much mariana that'd be greatly appreciated <laughs> hopefully they can understand the english <laughs> I, I hope so and if not i will link them to some english classes or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so for everyone out there listening if you've enjoyed this podcast do make sure that you share it with your friends and family and badminton players or non-badminton players because as mariana said it's a great spot for everyone so even if you don't play right now it is something that I swear, if you do get involved in and you start playing, you will love it. And then you will tell your friends about it and your family about it because it's a really, really great sport. So look, in summary, badminton is for everyone. It's a great workout. It's great to meet people. It's great competitively. It's great to achieve goals. It's great to push your boundaries. It's great for all of those things. And we just really want to share with the world 
how incredible our sport is. Sure thing. So get out there, train hard, play hard, have fun and share your love of badminton so that we can show the world how incredible our sport is. Also really great to have those transferable skills so that you can go into game shows like Exathlon and do really well and throw throw sandbags with extreme accuracy um, <laughs> and stay in the good house. It's all about the good house. Good house, good food, good music. Good house, good but... food, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what being good at badminton is about. It can really help you in other aspects aspects of your life sure. so if you want to connect with us you can connect with us on instagram facebook youtube linkedin and we also have a tiktok but we don't, but we do don't, we don't really much. do much on there we just we just watch people yeah, we, just watch, <laughs> yeah, we just watch other <laughs> soap opera like things on there and yeah contact us via our social media handle b-o-l-a-n-t-w-e-a-r follow on where or you can visit us on our website, www.volantwear.com, where you can shop some badminton clothes that are very exciting, very, very simple and a bit different to what's out there. There's also some really great resources on there as well. And you can contact us uh, anytime, just reach out to us because we'd love to connect with everyone in the badminton community, whether you're from Mexico or anywhere else in the world. So please give us feedback and we'd love to get in touch with you. Otherwise, we will see you on the next episode of the Badminton Podcast. Thank you. Thanks again, Mariana. Thank you so much. It was really fun. (laughs) (laughs) This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.